morning. Well, some of you are here. Let's see. 30 seconds per slide. Okay, got it. I'm going to try something that's a bit challenging this morning, a challenging subject, so I hope you can uh, focus on it here, especially towards the beginning. You might understand the, the, uh, the end here. There's, um, <clears throat> if we look at the rocks underneath our feet, uh, we go down to Stone Mountain, we've got that large granitic pluton down there that uh, they carved onto. We've got Mount Yona up the road here, which is another granitic pluton. This is once molten rock that was, uh, rose up in the midst of other rocks. The other rocks have since decayed away. Uh, and then even underneath our own uh, feet here on the university, a picture taken in the uh, borrow pit just north of the, uh, the uh, ball field, uh, we take rocks from there. Next, we see that uh, the samples that we take have a mixture of light-colored minerals and dark-colored minerals in them. Next, uh, there are small black flakes in there that are flakes of biotite. If you take the rock and, uh, and, and examine the rock closely, you're going to see some things in there that we're going to talk about today. Next. Uh, actually, these rocks, these minerals, the biotite is built from a crystal of, uh, it's based upon a silica uh, surrounded by four oxygens. That it's constructed in such a way that that makes next a tetrahedron shape, a kind of a pyramid shape. And you can stick these things together in a variety of ways. You can have individual tetrahedra, uh, that's one type of rock. Next. You can stick all the tetrahedra in, in a sequence, in a row, and get a different kind of rock, a stringy mineral, and then you can stick them together in two rows and get a different kind of mineral, and you can even put them together in sheets, to, and then the sheets, next, can be uh, laid on top of one another, and they're attracted to each other by electrical charges. Uh, the kinds of minerals that are made in this third way are the clay minerals, so clay is that kind of a mineral. It, it actually grows when it creates crystals, it grows out in straight sheets, and then the sheets are layered, and things can be stuck in between those sheets. Two other types of rocks that are in this category are the micas, muscovite, and the one I want to focus on, which is biotite. Next, the, uh, so biotite crystals can grow up to very large, they can go up to three feet in diameter, but they're very flat, uh, sheety minerals. Uh, they are so easily separated that next, you can actually take a, a piece of scotch tape and stick onto the surface of it and rip it up quickly, and you'll pull sheets of that uh, individual, sometimes only molecule thick sh uh, pieces of biotite up on the, on the, on the tape. Next. And that allows you then to look at these things under a microscope. And when you do, you find these structures here. They're very small. They're about the size of a cell from our body. Like those who've taken Bio 101 and have looked at cheek cells, this is about the size, these, these little dark objects are about the size of cheek cells in your, in your body. <clears throat> They're very strange structures, very symmetric circular rings, and uh, we're going to examine what they mean here in this presentation. Next, <clears throat> these are called pleochroic halos because they, they show up on a light microscope as a distortion of light. Uh, so that's their first name. Next, uh, you look inside the center of a number of these things, you'll find a very small mineral inside that called a zircon. It's made of uh, zirconium silicate, uh, and characteristics next of that, uh, that mineral is that, that that particular crystal is actually older than the biotite. It was already there before the biotite formed. And so the mineral, the tiny little crystal, is sitting there usually in a molten condition. The rock is molten. This particular mineral is a very, very high melting point, so it's sitting there as a hard mineral while the rock is, is, is uh, solidifying. And so when the mica forms, when the mica crystallizes, it will incorporate this next into the 
uh, fabric of the mica. So in between the individual sheets of mica, it'll capture these little zirconium uh, crystals. Next, uh, these, the, the important thing for our purposes is that zirconium is made of uranium. There's uranium in it, it's radioactive. So these little crystals in the middle of the uh, biotite uh, send out radioactive particles. Next. The first, the uranium that's most common in these minerals is uh, uranium-238, and it decays to thorium-234, and in the process, it sends out what's called an alpha particle. It's a tiny little particle from certainly our perspective, but it's a huge particle uh, when you're, if you're the size of an atom. It's actually the, the nucleus of a helium atom. It's got two protons and two neutrons, it's a pretty heavy little feller that gets shot out of the uh, uranium nucleus as it decays. So next, if we were to consider there was a bunch of uranium uh, atoms, let's say uh, 80 billion atoms at the point of that uh, red arrow, uh, at some point or another, one of these uranium atoms is going to decay and it'll shoot out a, an alpha particle that was given a certain amount of energy that will allow it to go a certain distance until it runs out of energy and stops. And if it's in a consistent substance, like a biotite mineral, it's going to go a certain distance because of the energy it's given initially. So as we consider the next one that decays, it will also shoot out at the same distance, but it'll go in a different direction. They're all randomly, which direction they go is, is completely random. So in the course of time, next, 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 um, you, you just shoot the thing. <laughs> You shoot out these particles in all directions at a certain distance away from the source and each time the alpha particle goes out, it plows through the biotite crystal and messes it up a little, a little bit and leaves a microscopic line of deformation. And after you get a bunch of these, and I'm talking a half a billion of these, uh, these decays, it has now damaged that, that rock, that mineral, in a sphere. Uh, so, no matter which direction you look at it, it's a round discoloration of the mineral. Next. And then, next. The, so, try to visualize this in three dimensions. But that is not the only decay. Thorium-234 also decays. Next. And, in fact, decays to a series of mineral, of, of uh, elements, all the way until it finally gets to lead 206, where it's finally happy and doesn't decay any longer. In the process of decaying, there are eight of those decays where it sends out al alpha particles. Each time it sends them out at a particular energy that's characteristic of that particular decay. So when uranium-234 decays to thorium-230, it sends out an alpha particle, but with a different energy than the alpha particle that was produced in 238. So each one of these produces another halo, another, another uh, sphere of, of uh, deformation in the mineral. So it produces concentric spheres in the process, eight of them. The other decays, the beta decays, are tiny little particles that don't affect, you can't see any effects of those decays in the minerals. Next. So as a result, you get this little, uh, the, the zircon in the middle sends out these, uh, these pulses of, of alpha radiation, producing concentric circles of, uh, of damage, radiation damage, and so we call these radio halos. Pleochoric halo is one, is just a description of the fact that it, you can see it. A radiation or a radio halo means that it's produced by radiation. Next, <clears throat> consider the eight different uh, decays that produce, uh, produce alpha particles. Next, we have measured in the lab how much energy the alpha particle has leaving the uh, nucleus. So we actually know that in air, like if it produced, you just uh, just do radiation in the, in the lab and figure out how far it goes in a particular substance. You can figure out MeV is just a measure of its energy. So each one has a unique energy. Some of them are very close to each other, which means that, that uh, some of these decays you can't discern one from another because it sends out alpha particles about the same distance. Next, it generates, and I created this slide uh, from actually photos of the... Uh, the uh, the radio halos, and there are in a complete 
uh, mature uh, halo uh, f- uh, five rings that you can discern. Next, the innermost ring is the one that uh, is produced by uranium-238. And if I take that first ring and set it at uh, 4.2 units from the center and set the last one, the biggest one, at 7.7, corresponding with the MEVs there, and then uh, figure out where the others should be. Next, it turns out that all the others fit in very nicely, well, almost. Uh, So we're fairly certain that these various uh, spheres are produced by the decay of uranium-38 through its eight alpha decays. Uh, So the innermost uh, circle, innermost sphere, is from uranium-238. The next uh, sphere is, uh, you can't tell the difference between uranium-234, 230, and 226 uh, radium. And then the next, uh, the next sphere is actually from radon-222 and polonium-210. And then the fourth one is from polonium-218. And the last one, the largest one, is from polonium-214. So we're able to identify the, the uh, element that decayed to produce any given ring. Next. And we... The only one that really doesn't fit there is polonium-218, which is really interesting. It may turn out there's some really cool stuff being told to us here that we don't understand at this point. Uh, But uh, otherwise, they fit very nicely, so we interpret these as the decay products of uranium-238. Next. So these are radio halos. Next. Radio halos begin developing, it's sort of like the old-fashioned photograph where you you put it into the right chemicals and gradually the picture appears before you. Uh, Obviously, at first, you don't see them at all. Individual uh, alpha decays you can't see. It takes millions, in fact, it takes hundreds of millions of decays to do enough damage for you to actually see the halo. So as it develops, When you get to about 100 million decays, we estimate, it begins to show up. You can see the individual, begin to see the, at least the darker rings. And then by a half billion, by about 500 million, you've got a well-developed, easily discernible uh, set of, of, of rings. If it continues, it actually damages it so bad you end up with a black, (laughs) black sphere. You can't tell the difference between and among the rings. Next. Now, the decay series, uh, each one of the decays has a certain half-life, how long it takes for that particular mineral on the average for half of it to decay into the next step. This varies quite wildly among these things. Uranium-238 decays to thorium-234 in a half-life of four and a half billion years. So if you have a bunch of uranium-238, at today's rates, it would require four and a half billion years for half of it to decay. On the other hand, go down here to uh, polonium-214 going to lead-210, to and the half-life is 164 microseconds. Uh, in other words, in 10 half-lives, which basically takes care of just about everything, in less than a, th- a thousandth of a second, you've, you've gotten rid of all of it. It's, it's all decayed away. So we have quite a range of half-lives, and these are going to be important as we consider this. Uh, But looking back at uranium-238, it's got a huge half-life. Next, as a consequence, since you need a half a billion uh, uh, decays to produce a a uranium halo, a complete mature halo, this puppy must be old. Next, you're going to need over 100 million years of decay to begin to develop that polonium halo, that uranium halo, so that you can identify it. That's at today's rates. Continue. Next. The other observation is, in the laboratory, those decay rates, those are measured in the laboratory. We've tried to change them. We've done all sorts of mean things to radioactive elements and tried to change those decay rates. And there is no reasonable, we can do it, there are some, we can create situations that change the decay rates, but if those things ever happened in the real world, they would destroy the planet Earth. Uh, So there's no reasonable way we know of to change those decay rates. 
So as a consequence, it looks as if it, it, it's going to take 100 million years to produce a uranium halo in, in our rocks. Next. An interesting observation is that if you plot the, uh, the strength of the alpha particle as it goes flying out, how fast it's going, compared to the decay rate, they're inversely proportional. In other words, the little guys that decay very, very rapidly uh, throw their alpha particles out really fast, really far. Uh, the ones that decay more slowly, they kind of push their alpha particles out more <laughs> without so much energy. Okay, so there seems to be a relationship between the decay rate and how far, how big these spheres are. So then when you observe the fact that spheres, radioactive halos in rocks of all sorts of ages have the very same radii, they're the same size, regardless of what age rock it is, it suggests, or many people believe, it suggests that next that um, the next that radioactive decay is constant. We don't know anything in the present that we can do to change it. We've got evidence in the fact that these radio halos are the same size that the decay rate hasn't changed. So we're seen, we seem to be stuck with the conclusion next that when you see these uranium radio halos, you're going to need 100 million years to form them. And they're found in the rocks on this campus. They're found in those rocks when you come in, turn into the, uh, turn in the beautiful little rocks in that garden there. There's rock, there's stuff with radio halos that need 100 million years to form. It's found in, in um, Yona Mountain, wherever that is from here. And uh, I guess it's over there. And, and uh, they're found in Stone Mountain, etc. All over the world, we've got evidence of great antiquity in the rocks. Next, we can make it worse. Uh, because it turns out that if you heat up the biotite, you can erase the damage. You get the, the biotite corrects itself and puts itself back into its original crystalline structure and just erases the halos. So you can obliterate the halos if you heat the thing up to over 150 degrees centigrade. So at about 300 degrees Fahrenheit uh, or, or above, you can't produce, you can't keep halos, they just disappear, which means that once a rock is heated up, it gets rid of all the halos, and only after it's cooled down will halos begin to produce. So when you see a halo in a rock, it means that it's been 100 million years since it was hot. It's not telling you how old the rock is, it only is telling you how long it's been that the rock's been cold. And so that means the rocks are older than that, Next. And so you've got 100 million years since the rock cooled down. Now this gets worse. Next. Because there are fossils we have found that are older than these rocks and younger than these rocks. In fact, some of these rocks come up and intrude the rocks that fossils are found in and melt them away or boil them away. And so we know that those rocks are younger than the fossils. So that means, if you put those two things together, that we have evidence of critters and death on this planet for more than 100 million years. Next. So we've got fossils that are over 100 million years old by this. Next. And it gets worse. Um, because now we consider that, that period of time that it's hot. We've considered the time since they've been cooled down. That's at least 100 million years. Now the period of time they're hot. Well, little tiny plutons, little tiny rock bodies like Mount Yona, that's only, that's less than a mile in diameter. It's not terribly big. There are some that are very big in the, on the Earth. Uh, Stone Mountain and Mount Yona are kind of small. It would take, however, about 10,000 years to cool those, those guys from their melted, molten condition. This is easy physics, I mean, to figure this out. It's, it, you just need that much time. The bigger it is, the longer it is. You got a bowl of chili and a pot of chili. The pot of chili stays warm longer than the bowl of chili. So surface area volume ratio and all that sort of thing, for those of you who want to know about that. Uh, <laughs> the larger the pluton, the longer it takes. These guys, like Mount Yona, about 10,000 years. So we have to add 10,000 years to the age of... Uh, these, these rocks. It's 100 million years since the rock cooled down. It's an additional 10,000 years we have to add, at least, at least for these plutons. Next. When you get to next, it's even worse for the rocks underneath this campus. 
Because the rocks underneath this campus aren't plutons. They're not molten rocks that came up and cooled. These rocks are rocks that were here already and were heated up by something else. And they're heated up on a large scale, like something the size of a state and uh, uh, entire mountain chains. And as a result, in order to produce these, you have to cool, to cool these guys off. It takes hundreds of millions of years to cool these off in many cases. The rocks, rocks around here, if you're conservative and trying to get it as small a number as possible, uh, we could maybe do it in tens of millions of years. But here again, we've got to add the, the age of the rock when it's cold to the age that it takes, the time it takes to heat it up. And we haven't even addressed the issue of how long it takes to put the rocks down deep enough to heat them up enough to heat them up to do this and then cool them off. So we have to get the time since it's hot, the time it takes to cool them off, and the time it takes to heat them up. We're talking about hundreds of millions of years. And there are fossils involved in this process that are that age and older. So this is, this is fairly strong evidence, next, that fossils around this planet, especially around this area, are more than hundreds of millions of years old. The laws of physics demand it. You can't, it, it, the, way, the way the laws of the universe operate, these things have got to be hundreds of millions of years old. Next. But, <laughs> looking in the same rocks, we found these other little guys. Besides the uranium radio, radio halos, we find these other little halos. <clears throat> these look at first glance like a uranium radio halo. Next. But actually, there are five rings on the uranium halo, but there are fewer rings on these other kinds of halos. In fact, the, one, the lower one there has only one ring. Uh, the, the others over there have three, and the uranium has, has five. So what's going on here? Next. The, uh, the reason we call this one a uranium-238 halo is because, next, circling the, uranium-238 is decaying through all of these things to produce eight different alpha particles and five different rings. So when you see the five rings, you know it must have been the uranium-238. If you chose something along the way, like uh, radon, you wouldn't produce five rings, you'd only produce four. Uh, or so on and so forth. So the fact that you got five rings means it's a uranium-238 halo. Next. So if we take, the, it turns out if we take these halos and compare them, next. So we sort of push the uranium halo over there, cut it in half and look at it. You'll notice that the rings line up. The, on, the, on the upper one there, you've got three rings and they correspond to the outermost ring of the uranium halo the next one, and the next one. They're missing the inner two rings. Next. So in the five rings, next, we just don't have the inner two rings, but we have the outer rings. Next. We know what decayed to produce each of those rings, so we know it must not have, whatever produced this halo, didn't have uranium-238. It didn't have uranium-234, thorium-230, or radon-226. Next. Looking at that decay series, next, it doesn't have the uranium, it doesn't have all that stuff, and if it had the thorium up there, right underneath the uranium, it would produce the others. So we know it must not have those either. Next. That leaves, we're all the way down to radon-222. Uh, since, however, radon and polonium-210 both have the same ring size, it could be that these are halos produced by radon-222, or by lead to, uh, let's see, lead to uh, polonium 218. There we go. Either one of those would produce the three rings that we have and not the five. Next. So we call these, these are either radon uh, 222 rings or polonium 218 rings. Next. These little guys. Put the little guys up next to the, uh, to the, to the uranium halo. Next. And you see it only corresponds to one of the five. It corresponds to the middle of the five. Next. 
So it's, it can't be that whatever's making the innermost ring, next ring, or the outermost rings, it must be either radon or polonium that is producing that little guy. Next. So looking at those decay, look at all those, all those must be out, but also you can't be lead 214 or bismuth 214 because you'd produce polonium 214, which isn't allowed, so you can keep, count those out. Next. Next. Now we're left really with only these possibilities. Polonium-210, so it can't be the radon because that would produce some others that we don't see. So it must be polonium-210 that produces the halo. But it could be bismuth-210 or lead-210 that was laid down there and decayed into polonium-210. So we don't know next whether this is <clears throat> uh, caused initially by lead-210 or bismuth-210 or polonium-210. One of those things has to start this halo. Next. So how do we do this? How do we get this? How do we go, f we, we kind of understand where the uranium halos come from, but what about these guys? Well, the thought is that uh, that biotite that I was talking about that has the little, little uh, zircon zircons in it, water can run also between the layers of biotite. And it can run along and dissolve out the, some of the elements that are in the zircon and carry them and deposit them further on down the line. So potentially, like in the, in the uh, case of the little green spots, uh, the little zircon is over there to the left, water comes flowing through between the sheets, picks up some stuff from the zircon and dumps it there at the green spot. Uh, it might dump one thing at green spot, another thing at the blue spot. And so maybe, What's happening is water is taking stuff from the zircon and moving it over to another location so that then you can, so it's moving maybe radon 222 or polonium 218, dumping it in place, and then that decays all by itself. And that's our best guess as to what's going on with these guys. No other explanation has ever been uh, brought up for this. And it turns out that you only find these little guys when there's uranium-238 in the same system, and you don't find them very far away. And the more uranium there is, the more of these other halos there are. So it does suggest that they're, they're what we call secondary halos. They're made from the uranium. Next. <clears throat> in order to produce these, however, we need, to, we need to transport at least 500 million of the polonium or the radon or whatever it is going to be. We've got to move at least 500 million of them we got to move them out of the, so water's got to be able to pick it up, move it, and drop it off again. So we've got to have a, some element that is dissolvable in water and for some reason leaves water. We also have to have the zircon has to produce 500 million of those, of those things. And we've got to, uh, it's got to do all that moving before the little guy, because you're carrying radioactive material. And that radioactive material can't, can't decay before you move it. You've got to move it faster than it decays. If it decays too quickly, you can't move it. Uh, and also, you then need the time, once you've finally dropped it in place, for the halo to form. Next. We also observe in the rock no alpha recoils. This is kind of a, it, it's a technical thing, but... If, if you're, let's say you're carrying a uranium atom with you and you're, you're running through the water there, you're in a canoe, you're carrying a, it's not a good idea, but you're carrying a uranium uh, atom on your shoulder and all of a sudden the guy sends out an alpha particle. It's like a gun that you've shot a projectile out from. It's going to shoot the projectile out and the, and the gun's going to kick back. It's going to recoil, right? Well, if you're holding this uh, uranium atom and it shoots a, uh, an alpha particle out, it's going to recoil. It's going to kick back. And when it kicks back, it's going to damage the, the rock. It's actually going to show up in the rock as it's going to distort the... And it's a bigger... I mean, uranium's pretty big. So it, it actually shows up in the rock. If, you've got, if you're transporting uranium or whatever from the uranium site to this other site, as it's going along, if it decays, it'll leave a mark. It'll show up as an alpha recoil. 
But we don't find alpha recoils in the rock. In between the uranium halos and these polonium halos, we don't find any recoils. Well, you say, well, that must mean there's no decay. But except for the fact that we don't, we would anneal these, we'd get rid of this evidence if the rock is very hot. So everything indicates that it's moving these things from one place to another while the rock is more than 300 degrees centigrade. That way it does produce recoils, but the recoils are smudged out. They're, they, they, are, they can't be seen because the rock is too hot. So that means that the, these, these things are moved around in water that's greater than 300 degrees Fahrenheit in temperature from one place to another. Now that also means that the water has to move these things that distance before it decays. But since the, since the, uh, the hot water would destroy the radio halos when they're formed, you've got to actually cool the rock also before the halos form. If the thing decays too quickly while the thing's still hot, you don't get any halo at all. So that means, next, not only do we have to supply 500 million atoms before things decay, not only do you have to move them uh, before the decay occurs, but you also have to cool the rock in the, before the thing decays. And that's going to be critical. Next. So let's look at the little guys. We need 500 million of uh, either lead-210 or bismuth-210 or polonium-210. We need the water to pick up one or, uh, or more of those, carry them, and then drop them off. We need to do all that, supply 500 million of these things, move them, and cool the rock in less time than it takes for those things to decay. And then we have to add to that the amount of time it takes the polonium halo to form. So first of all, how do we get our 500 million bismuth or uh, lead or whatever? If you look at what produces the lead 210, what produces the bismuth 210 polonium, a really short half-lives, 164 microseconds, 20 minutes, 27 minutes, 3 minutes, 3.8 days. The problem here is if you're going to get 500 million of these things and move them, you, can't, you have to go all the way back up to radon, uh, radium, the decay of radium, which has a 1,600 half-year life, to get, uh, for there to be, uh, how do we say this? If there was already that stuff in the rock, it's going to decay before you can even use it. Uh, so you have to go back to something with a long half-life to produce the atoms you need, but it takes a while to do that. Uh, minimally, next, it would take about 60 modern years of decay of radium to produce 500 million uh, atoms. So we need at least 60 years of time to produce the, the radium, uh, to produce all these other atoms necessary. Next, moving to these guys down here, they have short half-lives. From lead 210 to bismuth 210 to polonium 210, 23 years, five days, 138 days, the longest one is 23 days, so if we want to make this as long as possible to help out the people who think the earth is old, uh, we'd say what's causing this halo is lead being put into place, lead 210. If so, then <clears throat> we've got to move, we've got to uh, produce the 500 million atoms in less than it takes for lead 210 to break down. We have to move it in less time than it takes the lead to break down. And we have to cool it in less time than it takes the lead to break down. Next, basically it takes, uh, because of the half-life of 23 years, 10 half-lives, about 200 years, that's about how much time it will take before you've lost all your lead. So everything's got to happen in less than two centuries. You've got to produce 500 million uh, atoms in less than two centuries. You've got to move it, uh, you've got to move those atoms in less than two centuries, and you've got to cool the rock down in less than two centuries. And then the polonium halo takes about four years to form. Next, if we now turn to the other, and we'll keep that information in mind and come back to it. For the bigger halo, again, you need 500 million atoms. 
In this particular case, we're looking at it's either a radon or a polonium halo. Turns out that radon is a, is a uh, noble gas. And what that means is this little guy doesn't like to associate with itself, <laughs> with another radon uh, atom or any other kind of atom. So it'll go into solution into water, but it won't come out of solution and join other radon atoms or join any other atoms. So once it goes into water, it's downstream, it's gone. It won't ever be deposited. Uh, whereas polonium or uh, lead, they're attracted to sulfur. They love sulfur. So if there's any sulfur, and there always is in all these rocks, then it'll come out of solution and grab onto the sulfur and then accumulate there. And that'll be a place where a polonium halo can be produced or a radon or a, a, a lead halo can be produced. But uh, radon won't do that. So as a consequence, we can be fairly certain that these aren't actually radon halos. They're actually polonium-218 halos. Polonium goes into solution very readily, comes out of solution to grab onto sulfur, and so water can transport it and, and dump it. So these are actually polonium uh, halos. Next. Next. <clears throat> Uh, we can actually add a little bit of time, again, making it a little easier on those who think the Earth is old. If we, ca we don't carry polonium halos, or polonium, we actually carry the radon. And then let the radon decay into polonium, and the polonium bin be dropped off. That allows us to extend the time a little bit, because radon's got a, a, a longer half-life, uh, 3.8 days, as opposed to 3 minutes uh, so we can, we can make it a little easier to, you're going to see why in a moment. Next. Again, we, we need 60 uh, years of radon decay to produce our atoms. And then we've got to do all this stuff in 6 to 10 days. That's assuming we have radon as the carrier. Uh, if we had polonium as the carrier, we'd have to do this in 30 minutes. Uh, so, with the, with the, if we assume the radon, the slower guy, is carrying it, then we got to do all of this. We've got to supply all of our uh, atoms, we've got to move our atoms, and we've got to cool the rock in a week. Next. Now, what this means, then, is that 60 years of radon decay has to occur in less than a week. Wait a minute. <laughs> Something's wrong here. Right? If it takes 60 years to produce the atoms you need, but you've got to get all the, you got to produce all these atoms in less than a week, how do you solve that? The laws of physics say you can't do that, unless there was a time when the laws of physics were different, which is what is evidenced here. It must be that, radon, uh, that, that radium decayed at a much more rapid rate at the time this occurred, so that you can produce enough uh, atoms to create the process. And that becomes part of the story now. It indicates that we've got accelerated decay at some point in the past. The laws of physics operating today in the past operated differently, specifically when this is occurring. And, and the, the laws that we're most concerned about involve radioactive decay, that it was faster in the past. Next. An additional, and I'm giving you pieces of information, I'll pull it all together here in a bit. <clears throat> For regional metamorphism, I was talking about the fact the rocks underneath our, our feet are metamorphosed and that takes a long time and all this sort of thing. So commenting on that, a, a, a project was undertaken by Andrew Snelling, a friend of mine, who uh, went to the Smokies and I went with him. We collected rocks in the Smokies in order to, uh, in order to test the hypothesis that I I just, uh, I just described. If it's true that these polonium halos were produced by water moving through the rock and, and, and picking up polonium and putting them in a different place, then you ought to be able to identify situations where you know a lot of water, hot water, has gone through a rock. And when it has, you can expect that there should be polonium halos in addition to the uranium halos. On the other hand, if you have a dry rock, one that there's never been water, or you fairly good reason to believe there's no water in it, then you should only have uranium halos and none of the polonium halos. 
And the interesting thing about the regional metamorphism is when the rocks are metamorphosed in this like big, big areas, state-sized areas, that uh, there's different temperatures will produce different minerals in that process. And there's one mineral found at one temperature that when it's formed, it actually generates water. All the other met metamorphic uh, reactions uh, either take in water or don't produce water. There's one that produces a huge amount of water. And so it, there's, you can look at zones of metamorphism. There's a biotite zone. At a low temperature, the mineral that's produced in those circumstances is biotite. At a little bit higher temperature, there's garnets produced. Garnet is a metamorphic mineral only formed in circumstances of certain temperatures and pressures. Higher temperatures and pressures, starlight is formed. Higher temperatures, kyanite is formed. At the temperature right between garnet and starlight, there's a chemical reaction that occurs that generates a huge amount of water. So Andrew predicted that if we go and look at a bunch of rocks with kyanite uh, minerals all the way down to biotite minerals, we should see a whole bunch of polonium halos at the juncture between the garnet zone and the starlight zone because that's the zone when we produce a bunch of water. And we, so we took those samples, you might be able to barely see them, sample number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, on the bottom there going from the North Carolina border to, uh, uh, to, uh, towards Pigeon Forge through the Smokies. That road, by the way, just in case you were concerned, is not part of the national park. It's a state road, and so you have 30 feet on either side of the road where you can collect rocks. Uh, <laughs> and you can't do it in the, in the park. Uh, so it's really nice, and it turns out there's a single formation that's thousands of feet thick that is a single formation from one side of the park to the other, and so there's biotite throughout uh, that, and we can look for polonium halos throughout the whole thing, there's a few polonium halos found at sites 2, 3, uh, and 8, and 9, and 10, but right at the garnet starlight zone, there's a huge number of uh, halos. Uh, up to 10 times as many halos are found in every uh, microscope slide as we find elsewhere. Exactly what Andrew predicted. So we have very good reason to believe that this is exactly why these secondary halos are formed in this precise way, but also it means <laughs> we've got halos in here, so the halos are only formed after the rock has cooled. So these halos have got to, the, this polonium has got to, uh, 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 say it another way, it's got to cool before the polonium decays. But the polonium decays in only a week. And so we've got to cool these rocks in a week. We've got to, we're moving water through at 300 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures, over a statewide area, and then we got to cool the whole thing down in a week. Next. Then we have these little guys. There's some samples of wood uh, that's colified, found in various levels of the stratigraphic column out west, near radium, uh, uranium sources. So there's evidence that these, these rocks with fossils were near a uranium mine, Water running through the uranium picks up the uranium and, and creates polonium halos in the fossils, in this case, fossil wood. But notice they're not spheres. Uh, the ones on the left are, are ellipses. They were spheres, and then the wood was colified and compacted, making ellipses. The one on the right is even more interesting. There's both a, 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 a round... Uh, radius and a, a scrunched one. In other words, there have been there are two radio haloi produced, one before the wood was compacted and one after the wood was compacted. So next, we have, we have reason to believe that only one source, only one time did water go through the uranium and deposit polonium in, these, in, these, in this wood. And so it's all different ages, supposedly, of wood intruded at uh, one event by water through it. Next. The ellipses indicate that those radio halos were formed before the compaction of the wood. Next. The dual ellipse means it was 
There was one halo produced before the wood compacted, then it got squished, and then another halo formed afterwards. And we can explain that because if, in fact, both polonium and lead were brought in here, then the polonium would decay very quickly uh, and produce a polonium halo right away, and then the other... I'm lost. Would <laughs> the other would uh, the 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 lead halo would form afterwards? So the polonium halo would produ- would be produced within four years. In fact, within a year, it would be it would be easy enough to see. To and then if then the uh, the wood was crushed, then you'd after two centuries you'd produce another halo produced from the the lead. Uh, ultimately, the lead decaying to polonium to produce another polonium halo. So that means that the compaction of the wood came between about one year and two centuries, somewhere in between those two. Next. Uh, also, if you look, there are some uranium halos in here, not just the, uh, the, uh, uh, the polonium halos. And those halos have a lot of uranium and almost no lead in them. And you could take that ratio to determine how long ago it was that they were, uh, that the stuff came through, and it's, uh, it's, it's less than 10,000 years. Next. So it suggests that this compaction event occurred less than 10,000 years ago, and that it occurred uh, within a range of uh, one or a few and two centuries, one or a few years and a few centuries, uh, just 10,000 years ago. And it occurred in each one of these. So it means that those rocks are not different ages. Those rocks are the same age. uh, And the wood was buried and compacted at the same moment in time about 10,000 years ago in something between uh, a few years and two centuries. Next. So (laughs) the, the rocks are thought to be more than 100 million years old. In fact, they're uh, in the range of 100 million years old. They have, they're dated by radiometric dating at about 100 million years old. That means that 100 million years of decay occurred in less than 10,000 years in these situations. Next, so let's summarize it all. On the left, we've got the idea of modern rates. If you think about the modern world, and say, okay, now given how fast things occur in the modern world, then the following would be true. The uranium halos found in Mount Yona and found underneath our feet mean those rocks are at least, it's been at least 100 million years since it cooled. Uh, the, uh, it also indicates because it's in a Pluton, Mount Yona Pluton, that you've got to add another 10,000 years to that. And the fact that we have the rocks underneath our feet are metamorphosed requires tens of millions of years to cool them off after they've been heated up and to heat them up in the first place. On the other hand, the evidence from the polonium halos indicates that rocks that are dated as 100 million years old are less than 10,000 years old. It's been less than 10,000 years since those rocks have cooled. The evidence in the polonium halos don't indicate it, take, it took 10,000 years to cool the Pluton, Mount Yona, but a week. Mount Yona Pluton was cooled in a week. Now, by the way, the way that's done is water running through it. Water picks up the heat and takes it out. It's, it's coming through at a huge rate. We have reason to believe from the formation of, of, of minerals that an ocean of water is moving through these rocks to cool them off in a week. Not 10,000 years, but a week. Also, the metamorphism, that metamorphism that should take at modern rates tens of millions of years to cool off, is cooling off again in a single week. In fact, that means they've got to be buried to kilometers depth, buried miles deep, heated up, cooled off, and unburied by miles in a week of time, which is an extraordinary thing. The first column suggests the current laws of the universe are unchanged for millions of years. The second column, which is demanded by the data, is that the laws of the universe changed at some point in the past. Next. 
So rather than millions of years of time at modern conventional rates, there was a time when millions of years of geologic change occurred in this matter of days. Unlike the claim that some would have that the laws of physics are have always operated on this planet, unchanged for millions of years, there's evidence that the laws of the universe have changed, and as a consequence, billions of fossils were buried in a week of time. Not millions of years, but a week of time, billions and billions of fossils are buried. Next. In, in uh, Second Peter, we're told, there, there shall come in the last days. This is in blue because it looks like this thing over to the left. There shall come in the last days scoffers saying, where's the promise of his coming? For all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. The laws of physics have remained unchanged for millions of years, for billions of years from the beginning of the creation. But the Bible, the Holy Spirit says, but this, they are willingly ignorant. In other words, there's evidence to the contrary. There's evidence that the, the laws of the universe have not been constant. And they are willingly ignorant of this. That the world, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. In other words, that God created the universe. And the world that then was being overflowed with water, perished. We've got water in rocks. We've got water running through rocks. We've got water that's, that's doing the things we're talking about here in a flood. Be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Interesting, it's in the same passage. Next. There is a God who can change the laws of the universe. This is the God that created the laws of the universe. He brought it into being. This God is a holy God. Because he's a holy God, sin and deformations on that holiness must be taken care of. It is imperative. He cannot let that, that sin go unpunished. So, to take care of it, God changed the laws of the universe in such a way that the result was the death of all animals and all humans on this planet. As the global flood was a consequence of God changing the laws of the universe as judgment upon human sin. This God still is alive. He holds the universe together with the same word that he created the universe with, and he's holding it, it says in that passage, reserved unto the day of the next judgment. There is a judgment to come for the sin that has elapsed since the last judgment, since the flood. This same God, though, came in the form of a human being to take the punishment for that sin, for those who would accept him. Those who accept that, trust what God has done, he, he gives that person eternal life. They do not have to endure the judgment that is inevitable. Just as inevitable as the changes in the laws that occurred in the past, so it's inevitable that he'll do it again, this time destroying the earth and the universe by fire, by changing the laws of the universe. If you do not know Jesus Christ, if you have not trusted in him, you will be destroyed in that process. And you will have to pay for the sins that you've committed. But this same God loves you so much that he came in the form of a human and died for your sins so you wouldn't have to. You can avoid that judgment to come. Let's pray. Let's pray.